Welcome today. I'm with Preston So, Welcome, Preston. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Please introduce yourself. Sure thing. Uh, 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 my name is Preston So. I use the pronouns he, him, they, them, and I work at the intersections of content, design, and code, especially with regard to content strategy around conversational content, voice content, and everything in between. That's a lot. And there's one thing people should know about you, uh, and you can tell that a lot better than I can do. Uh, we had a dinner together, uh, and you just you sort of blew me away with the, the amount of language is nobody speaks uh, that you speak. But please enlighten us a bit. <laughs> sure. So my background is in linguistics and political science. I worked on language policy as part of my research. And what that entails is not just the fact that my career prospects in that area are very limited. Uh, it also means that I have a little bit of a natural um, inkling for chatbots and for conversational design, uh, conversation design, but also for really looking at some of the ways in which the languages that we speak around the world impact how we consider uh, chatbots and how we think about voice bots, how other language communities react to some of these different technologies that are coming out, especially around AI, and also gives that sort of sense of empathy and empathic design that I think oftentimes we as conversation designers as, and we as chatbot and conversational specialists are very, very much focused on in terms of, of course, what uh, I know other people here have been calling, um, you know, charismatic or human first uh, uh, chatbot design. So what should we do? Well, so one of the things that I think is really key, and this is very true of certain languages that um, I've spoken about in the past, Many languages are unlike some of the more common languages that we currently design for with chatbots and for voice bots. Uh, one good example, of course, is that in English, in Dutch, in German, there's really not much of a difference between how people speak and how they write. And one of the key differences between chatbots and voice bots isn't just the fact that we have a very different way of speaking from the way that we write, our manner of speech and the ways in which we interact verbally are, are totally uh, uh, disconnected from how we interact in writing and in text. It's also the fact that some languages have a huge amount of variance between the spoken and the written version. So if you consider languages uh, like uh, Greek, for example, or Portuguese, where um, the spoken rendition, the spoken version of that language is completely different from the written version. That means that oftentimes we have to look at how we can make chatbots and voice bots that cater to the ways in which users want to be able to speak or to be able to write. And those can be two very different things. I remember there was um, a, a, a conversation design leader over at Google who worked in the Brazilian Portuguese market. And one of the things that he, he shared, and he shares very often in his talks, is that one of the big problems that Brazil has had in the past is that you would have these uh, these IVR systems, these interactive voice response systems, these phone hotlines that would respond as if someone was reading off of a novel or a piece of paper, you know, off of a written formal, uh, like, you know, uh, document, as opposed to speaking to somebody in a natural uh, spoken form, a verbal form, that is, of course, the way that people speak day to day. And how does that influence AI? Well, I think today with the emergence of obviously ChatGPT, GPT-4, um, one of the things that I find very interesting is that you don't, as of yet, hear the output of what ChatGPT is saying. And I think there's a lot of interesting uh, insights that people have written about, um, including in you know my own book. I wrote the book Voice Content Usability. I, I, I speak quite a bit about the difference between that's coming out voice. in April, right? Well, that's actually that came out two years ago. Two years I've got ago. Another book. Oh, yeah, I saw an announcement last night. Yes. Yeah, so, so uh, just as a quick note, I've uh, written okay. four four books, um, and uh, two of them have to do with uh, content design and content strategy as it relates to these new uh, conduits for uh, for for user experiences. One of those is voice content usability, which came out two years ago. Um, and is, is, is part of what I'll be talking about at the conference today. Uh, the one that's coming out in April is coming out on April 18th, and it's immersive content and usability, sort of a spiritual sequel of that book. And it deals with spatial content design, three-dimensional content design. So what happens when we begin to take things off of mere voice assistants or chatbots or screens or smartphones and look at the spaces around us as uh, fodder for our user interfaces and user experiences. Uh, but to go back to voice content usability, what I, what I talk about a lot in that book is 
Well, if you look at the ways in which a lot of people create chatbots, a lot of times it's really focused on written language. And to this day, if you look at some of the transcripts that have come out from the Bing experiments, if you look at some of the ways in which uh, GPT-4 responds to queries in the case studies that have just been revealed, one of the things you notice is that it's very focused on a person who's reading that text. It's not really as focused on being legible from the standpoint of somebody who's listening to that text. And from my standpoint, I think when it comes to AI, it's not just about a convincing voice and a, you know sort of these simulacra that allow for a voice to be totally convincing as somebody who's human. I mean, that's something that is also a very, very hard problem to solve. But I think the more challenging problem is, well, uh, you know, for those of us who can really easily tell when somebody is speaking to us and, you know, you know, behind the curtain, it is a bot and they're not necessarily using slang or using the sorts of manners of speaking that we expect or um, with certain things that are perhaps, um, uh, you know, expletives or hesitations or things that are uh, very much um, not things that you find in the written language. Um, I think that's an area where, where AI still has a ways to go. Like, for example, um, will I ever talk to an AI that hesitates the same way, that says, um, the same way, that says, like, the same way as many English speakers do? Because that's one of the things that I think also is uh, coming about with the lack of attention to other language communities in some ways with AI. If you look at some of the languages that have... Um, really recently adopted chatbots and now have new uh, chatbots that have emerged, what you'll find is that a lot of these um, voices are, are just totally you know, unable to speak in the same way as people speak in the day-to-day -day life. And part of that is, is just not only due to diglossia, which is of course the fact that there's a very big distance between the spoken written language, but also just given the fact that oftentimes these LLMs, how we think about AI, how we think about chatbots has been so rooted by necessity through big data on written corpuses of text and on the written data that we have available as opposed to the spoken data. So one thing that really excites me, of course, is, you know, GPT-4 has begun to jump into multimedia. Well, I'm excited to see what's going to happen in the future with not just visual media, but also spoken media, um, oral media, uh, videos, um, and what it'll be able to do. But I'm also very worried. <laughs> and why are you worried? Well, as we were talking about just before um, we started on this podcast, uh, my, my um, interests have really come about from a lot of the work that I've done in the past. So about four years ago, I had a chance to work on a really amazing project called Ask Georgia Gov, which was the first ever voice assistant that was catering towards citizens of state government, of, of local government who want to be able to interact with state and local government in the United States without having to visit um, an agency office, having to visit, you know, some sort of a bureau, uh, and also people who might not be able to visit a website as easily. Uh, one of our core audiences was uh, the elderly and also uh, uh, disabled communities as well. Um, and one of the things that we found was that a lot of people preferred to, in the comfort of their own home, use tools like Alexa, use tools like voice assistance to acquire information. But of course, here's the issue and here's the problem. We all saw at uh, the Google uh, Bar demo, at the Bing demo as well, that these are great AI tools, but they don't always get everything quite right. And when it comes to government issued information, and I know here in the EU, there's a lot of information that you have to issue as part of the uh, in government. Other languages. In other languages, especially, right? Um, one of the problems is, well, how much faithfulness can you really guarantee to the letter of the law and the letter of the regulation and the letter of these governmental practices. Because one of the things that the state of Georgia in the United States has taken very, very uh, cautious care to do is to make sure that every single piece of content on their website has been vetted multiple times, it's always reviewed periodically, is something that literally nobody can misread, nobody can get wrong, because it's a matter of life and death. If it's somebody who's trying to get government benefits, if it's somebody who's applying for a driver's license, if it's somebody who's trying to enroll their child in the school, if it's somebody, and this is a very American thing, I apologize, if it's somebody who's trying to get health insurance, right? These are very, very important life and death decisions. And if you get the wrong information, well, you might be, you know, actually harming that person. So one of the things that our chatbot or voice bot was responsible for was delivering the same information you could find on the website to these folks, but in a spoken way, not in a written way. So there's a lot of things that we had to do to make that work. And I'll talk about that more later today. And I'm sure you can see the 
video of the talk as well. But one of the things that really worries me about AI is the fact that you're not, you're never going to have that complete control over what the bot is going to say. There's just no way. I mean, with, with GPT, with these predictive models, with LLMs, you just have no way to completely guarantee that you're ever going to get the same paragraph again that's exactly the same. Unless you somehow, of course, you know, force that in or, or you know, make that something that, that, that is part of the product. And so what worries me is that, you know, with these factual errors, well, they're, they're fine if you're in a technical demo and, you know, you're just trying to get your stock value to go up. Right. But when it comes to actual life and death decisions, when it comes to state and local government, and, and these are people who are very much in chatbots, very much in voice bots. Um, obviously, uh, the state of Georgia is one of the most forward looking and innovative state governments in the United States. And they're already well, well, well into chatbots, but they also are very worried about their content being misconstrued, about people getting the wrong information, about people not receiving benefits um, or not receiving uh, a certain things that they're entitled to um, in terms of their rights. And I know, for example, in the Netherlands, there was a very recent scandal uh, around benefits that really came about from not just human error, but also some of the technology that was involved underneath. I'm ashamed to hear you know about that in the States <laughs> as a Dutchman. But yeah, that's a problem. It, it sounds like there's a, a technological a gap between the state we're in with the AI models, the LLMs, and, uh, and the, the chatbot technology and how to secure um, a good outcome, a guaranteed outcome. Um, how do we bridge that gap? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, I don't have the full answer today, obviously. We can uh, start with half of the answer. Uh, yeah, and if I did, I would probably, you know, probably be charging a million dollars for it. Uh, but um, probably a lot more than that. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> <yeah. cheap>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, But I think you know one of the things that has to happen is we, you know, we have to figure out a way. And I think there's a lot of interesting work being done in this regard. Um, we have to figure out a way to be able to dial up and down sort of the the, the flexibility of how. Uh, AI is able to kind of go into its own free volition. And we see this already with what uh, Microsoft has done to, to really kind of tone down, right, what Bing is saying and what Bing is doing. Um, but I think what's more important is what we have here is, as, you know, as you mentioned, these two extremes. On one extreme, we have these very carefully edited, and, and you know, this is why I'm so you know, passionate about content design and content strategies, because in content management, it's all about getting the content exactly right, fine tuning it, reviewing it, you know, uh, auditing it, making sure that's absolutely perfect for the audience and exactly correct. Then you have the other side of it, which is, well, you know, there's kind of this loosey goosiness to how, you know, well, maybe if I'm asking for, let's say, um, some information about um, where to find, uh, you know, where to register to vote, for example, well, you know, there are certain things that you can probably elide in that response that the AI has really great discretion over. If there's a way for, for example, those who are state and local governments or uh, uh, you know, super national governments like uh, the EU who want to be able to issue very, very clearly what the content is that they want to issue, they should be able to put those in as kind of, um, let's say, you know, completely unadulterable um, uh, sections of that content. Hard facts. Hard facts, exactly. No alternative facts, no alternative facts, no fake news, right? Because that's one of the things that I think is really challenging in today's world. We are living right now in a world where trust in government has never been lower, um, where a lot of citizens just, just don't believe in what the government is saying. And what worries me is when you're talking about a chatbot, I mean, so many people, the, the, the level of trust people have in a chatbot, I mean, you know, is you're talking about a blank screen that has no watermark of a government on it, no sort of no sort of authoritativeness that this is, I'm talking to somebody that is the voice of the government, um, that can lead to some very tricky situations when it comes to trust. And so one of the things that I think is, is very important is that ability to use knobs and dials to say, well, let's, let's bring back the flexibility and the custom, kind of the, the free will, let's say, of the AI to be able to make up its own responses and to go off in this potentially less factual landscape and to also be able to issue certain data, certain content, certain things, certain pronouncements that we know are things that are essential because they could end up being life and death decisions. Talking about life and death, if you would use all your knowledge and project that on um, chatbots and conversational AI in the medical field, mm. how do you view that? Well, I was talking with another speaker here at the conference who, who works in the medical field, and I think there's 
some interesting quandaries there. Paulina. Uh, yes, Paulina, yeah. So there's some really interesting uh, 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 issues there, right? Uh, the first, obviously, is regulations. Um, now, I don't know as much about the European Union's um, kind of context of that or here in the UK, because I realize we're no longer in the European Union. Yep. But uh, in, in the US, obviously, um, as many know, we have HIPAA, which is a very, very strict set of regulations that um, guide health privacy and health data. One of the things that came about in the past uh, 10 years when Alexa was really big is, you know, obviously Amazon got into a lot of trouble for Alexa recording conversations. Um, and that's one of the big reasons why, for example, uh, when we worked on Ask Georgia Gov, we decided not to save any user information. We decided not to save any information about what the user said, not to save any information about, you know, email uh, addresses or phone numbers, even though that might have potentially improved the user experience and the customer journey by making our voice interface actually cater more to that user specific situation. But we didn't want to risk that because we're talking about obviously life and death situations like medical insurance, like Medicare and Medicaid, right? Which are, which are very, very um, sensitive subjects in the US. But what I think needs to be uh, addressed as well is, well, what is the guarantee of privacy, right? What is the sort of transparency? that we can actually see. And this is something that um, has been talked about quite a bit. I actually was on a panel a few months ago um, about the, the ability um, for, for us to look at AI and to be able to parse through how exactly the data that we're gathering um, through all of the training is something that uh, we can actually analyze and say, okay, this is the part where you know we're seeing potentially a privacy violation, so on and so forth. But what I will say is neither the EU, nor the US government, nor any other governmental entity is anywhere close to having the technical know-how to be able to actually dig in in that sort of way. Um, and so that's one of the things that I think is, is, is very interesting is you look at this chatbot, right? You're typing stuff into it. You're revealing a lot of personal information to this chatbot. The chatbot also knows a lot about you. I mean, if you look at some of the, the journalists who have communicated with um, you know, uh, 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 Bing, it's it's really kind of intimidating how much, you know, information that they're able to glean. Well, how do you know that that information you're giving them could potentially lead to, for example, you know, somebody having access inside of that company and then being able to hack into your systems or being able to actually do much more nefarious things like dox you or uh, harass you, right? So, so these are things that are very big ethical questions that honestly, to be frank, a lot of people have spoken about, but I don't see the big players like OpenAI, I don't see the big players like Microsoft really addressing those elephants in the room. You know, you see a little section, a few paragraphs about it in OpenAI's most recent blog posts. I'm, you know, I don't mean to call them out, obviously, this is, this is the case with everybody, but you know, what are we gonna do to guarantee ethical AI from the very, very, very foundation of it? And then the, the main question, uh, my main question then remains, um, who is ultimately responsible for, for, for that point? Is that uh, OpenAI or Microsoft? Or is that the actual user, the, the company in between that, uh, that uses the, the, uh, his API to GPT-4? Yeah, it's a very good question. I think you would, you would find that there are people on both sides of that um, sort of debate. Um, now you're in charge, tell me. Yeah, yeah. So, what would you make responsible? Well, you know, um, I don't want to reveal too much about my, uh, my, my political leanings here, but, you know, I, I, I do believe that, that regulation is necessary. I do believe that some modicum of privacy regulation, some modicum of, of deeply um, controlling uh, the direction that user information goes is extremely important um, because otherwise we're going to end up in a, a very, very tough and challenging future uh, for user privacy. At the same time, I definitely understand that people want to put the onus on the user and the user takes a big risk. But, you know, to be frank, when it's, we're talking about our grandmothers, when we're talking about our, you know, aunts and uncles who, who, who already have trouble, right, you know, falling into the trap, they're, they're already falling into the trap of these, you know, horrible uh, phishing emails and, and, you know, these things that pop up on their, on, on their smartphones. Um, we, are, we are so close to that kind of snowball effect where, you know, they're just, you know, people who are, who are less adapted to technology, people who are new to technology are simply not going to be able to uh, uh, understand and come to terms with the risks to their privacy um, as 
uh, as others will. But of course, there is the argument that governments don't really know that either. So it's a hard question. Thank you very much, Preston, for being here, for sharing your knowledge. It was very uh, insightful. And I, I learned a lot, actually. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all.